Hey, welcome. It's a midweek show, okay? I actually I want to talk about albums. I'll let someone sit down first. Yeah, yeah. Um, he woke up. It's daylight, and he woke up, which is kind of unbelievable in itself. So I want to talk about some albums that I have brought back into my collection. So this is nothing new. This isn't like, well, what was that? You know, that was kind of odd. And what? Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't like me. And <laughs> now I'm thrown off once again. Uh, so, so these, these are ones that albums that I really had. What the hell? Hey, knock it off. Um, <laughs> God, albums I really liked. But I lost, and I brought back in. And there's some stories behind them. So I kind of want to, uh, I'll show you what I, some of this. Now, I mean, I brought in tons of this stuff already, uh, more than I should have, I, I would have to say. But here, here's a few that were just kind of funny, fun, and there, there's some cool stuff behind it. So let's get going here. Um, let's begin with this. I used to have a... A lot of Van Morrison. In fact, I had quite a bit of his collection. Uh, now, as I rebuild, it's like, uh, you know, I'm going to pick and choose. I, I remember Astro Weeks when I bought this. And I, I'd read, again, I used books like Rolling Stone. So in the 80s, as I was buying music, as I was learning about new things, these were my guides. And it said, five-star album, you know, a must-have. I had no idea what I was getting into with it, no idea. So I bought it, and after I listened to it, I go, well, that just wasn't very, you know, I didn't really snap my fingers to it or dance to it. And um, I was a little disappointed. Well, I've grown into this album, and, and now, obviously, I rebought it. I brought it back in, you know, uh, because it's a very, very important album. What was interesting, what was going on at the time, though, is Van Morrison, when this was made, it was around 68, and he was spending a lot of his time in Boston then. Uh, he'd gotten over there. Uh, he he was um, found a place in Boston. He was making a lot of music. He picked up local musicians, and they were going from bar to bar, little clubs, and, and, and playing. And they were a garage rock band, really. I mean, it was like them. It was called the Van Morrison Controversy. And it was very electric. Feedback, the whole works. Well, they have a concert. And um, the name of the club was, um, at, at, it was at the Catacomb. And and they, uh, the bass player, um, Kilban, Kilbane, probably got it wrong. His, his bass wasn't working. And it was just feeding back, and he couldn't get anything out of it. And and so, you know, like, oh, what are we going to do? You know, we got this, uh, you know, we, we need, we have a concert coming. So he goes, well, wait a minute. I'm, he, he says, I'm going to run over to my alma mater, Berkeley School of Music, and I'll get a bass. So he went over there, and he comes back with this upright bass. Well, the music's made for a electric bass. So they sat, and they redid the arrangements real quick. Uh to make it so it would be more with the upright bass. And they changed all this music from electric to acoustic. They played the concert. And Van Morrison loved it. He goes, that was, you know, he just thought that was really, really good. Because it came out soft and came out with this real jazzy feel. And he, he was excited. And, and they say, and again, this, this, this story comes from a, a guy named uh, Bebo. He was the drummer. Uh, and, and he said it just kind of changed Van Morrison's thought about music in that this soft, jazzy thing is the way to go. Uh, so, supposedly, that's how Astral Weeks began, you know, and it, it changed. Now, the other one I just picked up, and this is part of, this is the new reissue uh, for, uh, well, actually 2020. It is um, Van Morrison, the East Street Choir. I mean, I really like the early Van Morrison stuff. Now, uh, the song Domino's on here. This came out in 1970, I, I, I believe. But Domino actually was written in uh, 1968. 
So uh, the guitarist, again, this was in Boston. So John Sheldon was, was the guitarist, and he was just noodling around, and he was playing these, um, actually he, he was playing uh, a ro the Rolling Stones version of the Bo Diddley song, Mona. And Morrison's up on the, um, what, you don't need to lick me. And, and, and Morrison's up on the drum set, and he's listening, kind of playing, and all of a sudden he just, he pulls over the microphone and just starts, what, dude, calm down, man. Sit. And 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 he calls, brings over this microphone, and just begins to sing. Uh, and he starts riffing and he comes up with the whole domino song. So right then and there, he um they, they do domino. And when they're done, he just looks at um, Sheldon and goes, That was a real motherfucker. Uh, and it became part of their set. But it was very electric, very garage rock at the very start. Uh, and so, you know, again. As Morrison shifted to this jazzier side, Domino also kind of changed. So, two kind of interesting stories dealing with those albums, uh, music that I really liked. Now, in, in the 80s, as I was reading these Rolling Stone books, uh, and one I had, the guide I had at the time was from uh, the uh, very, like, 88, like 1981. There was one album in there, Five Stars. And his Michael Hurley and the Holy Modal Rounders have Morsi, have Moisey, have Moisey. Uh, and and I, I didn't know what this was, but it was just, it had five stars. So I, I needed to get this album. Uh, and it, it was on a list. So I had my own handwritten list in there. And it took me many, many years. And I had finally found it. Uh, and it was kind of weird. <laughs> you know, it was... It was uh, comical, you know, yeah, there was whimsical lyrics, uh, kind of a bluegrassy country kind of thing, but Rolling Stone raved about the album, so I had it. Well, I had a buddy here in town, and, you know, he had this, and he gave it to me a heck of a price, so I thought I would pick that thing back up again. But, you know, this was a five-star album when I bought it. So I, I had this, so I, I, I was looking at the one Rolling Stone that rated five stars, I no longer have. I mean, that book is gone, but I did bring this one back into my collection. So I looked at this and talked about Michael Hurley. Again, essential. That was an essential album. And now it just goes, cheerful, idiosyncratic singer and songwriter, specializes in the sort of off-brand country music that lacks both slick sophistication of Nashville product and off-hand virtuosity of bluegrass. Um, its rough hewn arrangements hold special appeal, though these hardly qualify as essential listening. So, you know, Rolling Stone in 10 years really changed their mind upon that album. Uh, pretty funny. Yeah, it's a... It's, it's, it's not the cheapest album in the world, but it, it's, it's something different and and kind of fun and um from michael hurley so have more see this i just picked up at my record store it's a reissue from 2015 and bitches brew i had a mofi of this this is one of those lost albums that haunts me the most i tried to save all my miles davis but somehow this mofi escaped me and i didn't see it in the wreckage of the basement and it's like, God bless it. I, so I check prices on it. I go, well, I, you know, if I go to the bank, I can get a loan and, may, and maybe buy <laughs> that MoFi again. Uh, because this is an essential album to me. It's like, a, you know, top 20, probably maybe top 10 album, The Bitches Brew. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I, you know, I learned about, you know, Miles Davis in my 40s. Uh, and this was the second jazz album I listened to. It was, uh, it was kind of first right there, and then it became Bitches Brew. Uh, and, and I have a nice, huge box set of Bitches Brew, CD box set of it. But I wanted the, this. And um, it wound up suddenly at my record store here in town this week. There it was. You know, he had someone bring this in, this nice used copy that's beautifully done. And so I was able to get this most important album, you know, for me that I really, really love and bring it back into my collection. Another group that I lost, Los Lobos. 
<laughs> my usual records falling down, but I'm in a different location. Lighting's pretty good in this location, don't you think? Uh, so Los Lobos, huge fan of Los Lobos. I had, uh, between CDs and um, LPs, I had most of their material. Uh, and so I'm looking, okay, what do I really need? And I bought the Mofi Kiko already. But this was like their second album, How Will the Wolf Survive? And this is just such a classic. Um, the first Los Lobos I ever had, though, this was the very first Los Lobos I bought. Now, this is the Mofi Repressing. I just bought the regular one. In, in Rolling Stone magazine, they had this review. And they're talking about Los Lobos, the group. Um, and... and um, it just, it sounded exciting, something different. The Tex-Mex is what it kept talking about. And I thought, hey, I, I have to try this album out. And I bought this thing. And it was just, it was one of these enlightening experiences. And it, it what it did is it created in me a love for Tex-Mex type music. I mean, you have uh, one, you know, one time, one night, shaken, shaken, shaken. I, that's just great. All all I wanted to do is dance. Um, the Tears of God set me free, Rosalie. It was just, it was like a party. But yet they also would bring in, you know, the um, Spanish lyrics and uh, play some folk music. Totally blew me away and made me a Los Lobos fan. This album here made me a lifelong fan. So I did have this one, obviously, in vinyl, How, How Will the Wolf Survive? There was one before this that I had also. Uh, and and this is if you find this one and generally it is not it, it's 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 really inexpensive. This is just a great place to start with Los Lobos. How how will the wolf survive? It has a wonderful song um, Evangeline on here. Uh, Don't worry, babies on here. Um, it's. Um, it, 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 again, it's this mix where they use the squeeze box. They have they have the accordion that they play, and its accordion sounds incredibly beautiful. Uh, and their voices meld together, wonderful. And so you have the folk feel of Los Lobos of, of Mexican music with American rock. Really, really good. I don't own La Bamba, and really, La Bamba does. La Bamba is the one album that never really appealed to me. It just seemed kind of too commercial. This one, though. I only had on CD, and I got this on vinyl now. Uh, this is The Neighborhood. To me, this is the pinnacle. This album is so beautifully written. Uh, there is um, Down by the Riverbed, Emily, Angel Dance. And there's the most beautiful song in the world. It's called Little John of God. And uh, it, it's, it's a soft, it's a quiet song. It makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand when they sing it. It's just incredible. Incredibly beautiful stuff. There's the Giving Tree, the Neighborhood. Uh, it is one of the most wonderful albums, uh, easily. Yeah, uh, when I did my top 100, I didn't have this in vinyl. This would have been in, the, in, in my top 25. It was such. Um, the CD was um, just one of my favorites to play all the time and so i'm uh, super excited to get um this one in vinyl the neighborhood uh obviously to get how will the wolf survive and um uh, by 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 the light of the moon by los lobos three just incredible albums from the 80s and the beginning of the night finally ah let's get down here hold on it's a little harder i have two more Steve Miller Band's Greatest Hits. Ooh, it's the Greatest Hits package. Uh, I get, a Steve Miller Band, I had quite a bit of his catalog. Uh, I kind of stopped, though, by um, toward the late 70s. I just thought it got kind of goofy. I remember Steve, the, the thing I remember about Steve Miller Band is uh, my younger brother and I, we were, it was Christmas time, so we always went to Chicago to see my grandma. You know, came out of rural Nebraska. So it was a big deal. We were at the shopping mall. And we go by this record store there. And what I heard was, um, what was the song on here? Threshold. Threshold's a thing. And it's just this, the synthesizer that's going on. And never really heard synthesizer music before. And me and my little brother, we just stopped. And we go, oh my goodness. Now, I knew Steve Miller Band from The Joker, Fly Like an Eagle, all that. Um... And, you know, in fact, I remember the um, 
45s. Oh, I, I was at the record store. I said, what 45 do I want to buy? It was uh, either Jim Stafford's I Don't Like Spiders and Snakes or Steve Miller Band, The Joker. I, I, I bought Jim Stafford. <laughs> and you know, I was later in life go, God, what was I thinking? Man, The Joker's such a better song. I listen to all the time. I don't listen to it. I like, I like spiders and snakes. That ain't what it takes to love me. Um, oh, well, that's the way it goes. So, but that one song, uh, I would just say it haunted me. I think it was off the Fly Like an Eagle album. So he has a couple albums I really want. But the greatest hits, again, limited space. Do I really need a bunch of Steve Miller or do I want his hits? Or Steve Miller band, I want his hits. I like his early blues stuff, but you only have so much room. Final one, I have this in CD. It's uh, one of those Walmart exclusives. This is the only one they had left of my uh, one, but it's the one I wanted. It's a Metallica's Black Album. It was the first real Metallica I ever listened to. I had it all on CD. I, I, I had the early stuff on CD. This is the one that I could hum to. This is the one I could sit there and sing to. I could put it on the car and I could just start yelling. I could play the dr air drum, play the air guitar, whatever. It was great. It was haunting. Enter Sandman is haunting. Uh, it was just an incredibly um, sad but true, holier than thou, the unforgiven. It was just good song after good song after good song. I think incredibly well written. It is a com it is very commercial for Metallica, and that's what I liked about it because my ears are very commercial, and this had it. I didn't come out; they weren't bleeding, you know, you know, from the loud noise or anything. Wonderful album, and so for me when it when I my my heavy metal instincts, which aren't, aren't too big here, this is the one I needed to have. Um, it makes me super happy. So those were my recent pickups, uh, bringing things back to my collection that I really, really love, and um, some of the reasons why on that. So, Cat says hi. I say hi. And it's daytime. I'm doing a daytime video even, because it's midweek, right? And... Um, Gotta do this before I head out on the road. So, thanks for watching. Have a great one. See you Sunday, I hope. Bye.